Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. I, I really don't know what else to say other than Phil is probably the most entertaining scientist I have ever had the pleasure to meet. So Phil Plate, Dr. Phil Plate. Thanks, Chris. No worries. Okay. Testing, testing. Hi, my name's Phil. I'm a dork. It's been 20 minutes since my last tweet. Um, hi, Phil. Hi, thank you. Um, it's, it's really cool to be here. Uh, I've, I've known Chris for a few years, and um, he's been trying to get me to come here, and I've always been on travel, always been busy. This year, he sent me a very short note on Skype that basically said, Gnome Dex with the dates, and then, and then F you, if you can't make it. And I thought, well, I don't want to get Chris angry, so I think I'll come. Um, how many of you here consider yourself skeptics? Yeah, four of you. Oh, a lot of you do. Um, how many of you here are skeptical of the people who claim they're, they're skeptics? There's also, yeah, yeah, there's, there's nothing cooler than meta-skepticism. Am I really skeptical enough? I, I don't know. Um, it, it's a difficult topic because everybody's skeptical about something. And, you know, you might say, I don't believe that that guy from the Bowflex commercial really got those six-pack abs using the Bowflex, because when the Bowflex first came out, it had been out for like a week, and I don't think he got those, those abs in a week. Uh, up to and including really big topics like politics and religion and, and, and stuff you see online. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I did want to show you one thing, though. Chris said we first met when he did Call for Help on Tech TV. And it turns out in the annals of the web, you can find this stuff in the deep bowels of the intertubes. You can actually find the first time that we were on his show together. This is about a minute clip. Hang on. Oop, no sound? Oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> See, that, that's us. We're extras in this movie. No, no, no. Because they're so cold sitting out in deep space, that cold sort of, you can think of it as leaking out, but when, when they pick it up, they're so hot. This is actually a meteor of it. It's a sample from the meteor crater in Arizona, uh, part of an asteroid which is probably about 100 meters across, made of pure nickel iron, that hit in the uh, U.S. desert probably about like 50,000 years ago. This thing. Yeah, that thing right there. And you can see, now don't touch the yellow stuff. Oh, that's the fungus in our space. Oh, don't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> The stuff is uh, melted and blown up. What's it called? Retinal blitz. Retinal blitz. Yeah, put that down your glass. Mm. Um, it's black. And you see when you cut this thing up and you flip it over to the other side, it's actually a metal. And you can see the crystals in there. Those crystals are actually uh, show that it's near it because you don't get those when you get iron cooling under gravity. So it's not in space, it's hot and cool. And this came right. from the from the science. And this crater right here is the Barringer crater in Arizona. In fact, the puzzle piece, if I just pull it up, just right, I can get it, like right behind you. All right, um, just a couple of dorks on TV, but that's how I met. Uh, that's how I met Chris many years ago. We had a lot of fun with that, and um, wound up going on the show a few more times. And so over the years, we've we've had a lot of fun together. Um, coming here to Gnome Dex is interesting because I've talked to groups of teachers and students, retirees and scientists, and at libraries and schools and all kinds of places. I've talked in all kinds of odd venues to scientists and skeptics and science fiction conventions. Uh, the guys before me were making Asperger's syndrome joke. Believe me, oh my gosh. Uh, I hang out with skeptics and scientists and science fiction crowds. Uh, I'm familiar with that. But this is the first time I've spoken to a high tech crowd of people who can crush me online if, if you so desire. So um, I'm just wondering, I, I want to keep a, a Twitter trending thing up here because I figure if, 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 uh, if Gnome Dex starts trending a lot, that means I'm boring and you're having a lot of time to tweet. So I'll have to make sure I keep, keep track of that. Um, I asked you how, how many of you people think you're skeptics, and it's funny because everybody thinks they're skeptical about something, even the most wide-eyed people who believe in everything that comes down the pipe. They say, well, I'm skeptical about some things. I'm, you know, I'm skeptical that my shampoo will make me look like the, the person in the commercial. Um, I'm, I'm very skeptical of that myself, actually. Um, 
Skepticism is itself misunderstood. It's kind of a meta joke uh, among skeptics that people don't understand what skepticism is. It is not cynicism. It is not being bitter. It's not denial. It's not saying, I don't believe you. Well, in fact, it is saying, I don't believe you. For if you define belief as, having, uh, as, as thinking something is true without evidence, which is, which is kind of how I think of, of the word belief, but not everybody does. But if you are asking somebody for evidence, if you're not just simply saying, you're right, I hadn't thought of that, you must be right. And if you're not questioning what they're presenting, you're not being skeptical. That's what it is. You question them. You ask for the evidence. And it's not just that if somebody presents you evidence, that's not, uh, that's not enough. Their evidence has to be backed up. You have to look at that evidence and make sure it's good. You know, I, I talk to people who don't believe the Apollo landings are real. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, you probably are. Y'all live online. You've seen it as, as a joke everywhere. There are people who honestly think that NASA faked the Apollo moon missions in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And they claim, they call themselves skeptics. And that is so irritating to real skeptics because what they're doing is they're saying, I've looked at the evidence. And I say, no, you haven't. You know, you really haven't because if you'd looked at the evidence, you, you'd probably realize you've been wasting your life all these years. Um, <laughs> They're not really examining what they're seeing. And, and when you're skeptical, you can also say, you know what, I can look at everything that's going on around me and base my conclusions on that as well. I don't just have to examine the evidence. If somebody comes up to me and espouses 20 different wacky conspiracy theories, there's not a whole lot of reason for me to necessarily believe them when they, when they tell me number 21. Um, I, it's okay to base things on a little bit of context. Um, you have to use logic, and that turns out to be complicated. It's really, really easy to get tricked. And there are a lot of logical fallacies you can use. I just used one, in fact, by using um, an ad hominem and saying, if somebody is crazy, I don't have to listen to what they say. That's not really true. But you can put it in context and, and try to figure things out from there. There are a lot of logical fallacies, fallacies like that that sound, it sounds like some, what somebody's saying is correct. You know, I've studied this for years, so I know what I'm talking about. Well, that's an argument from authority. I don't care how long you've studied it, you can still be wrong. So you need to be able to show me that evidence. Um, and the other thing, and this is the hardest thing, and as, as someone who is a practicing scientist for a long time, and someone who's a blogger now, uh, dropping an idea when it's wrong, yeah, that's, that's tough. Uh, there's nothing harder than, than putting yourself into a blog entry and, and that sort of thing for, for 200 words. And then somebody coming in saying, oh yeah, and here's exactly why you're wrong. And then you have to go back and say, yeah, I, I screwed that up. Um, I actually have a, a, an open uh, policy on my blog that when I make a mistake that is substantial, not if I screw up a date or, or a number that's not important, but if I have something where I've said something wrong, I don't edit the blog. I put a strike through in the words where I'm wrong. Uh, correct it and in brackets say, yeah, screwed up here. Here's, here's where the correct stuff is. And it turns out if you're really, really wrong a lot in a blog, that can get confusing. Um, <laughs> but uh, that, that happens too. I've got a couple of, uh, on my old website, badastronomy.com, which was the static website where I had you know, HTML pages, movie reviews, and things like that. That's, um, that can get pretty confusing because there are times I've just screwed up a calculation and then based an entire you know, entry on it. Um, on the blog, it's a little bit easier because you know, it's a blog. People an hour later have totally forgotten what you've written about, so it doesn't matter. Um, science and skepticism are two sides of the same coin. People like to equate them, and I don't think that's really true. Uh, science is a tool to investigate the universe. It's a, tr it's a way of figuring out what's real and what isn't. It's a model, that it, it's, a, it's a pathway that you follow. You say, I have an idea, because I've seen something or I've heard something, and I think, you know, maybe I have an explanation for this. Well, is my explanation right? Can I test it? Ooh, yes, I can. And I test, and it turns out, ooh, wrong. Damn. Okay, well, start again. Maybe, maybe I need to do this. Maybe I need to do that. Whatever. Skepticism is, a, is, a, is sort of a, a secondary tool that you apply on the line as you're doing that science. You're examining that evidence. You're not, you're not just believing it. You're, you're questioning yourself, saying, gee, I have these observations. Maybe my observations are screwed up. One of the things I like to do, and, and it's funny because people don't understand it on my blog a lot, I love posting optical illusions. Uh, I posted a couple of killer optical illusions recently, just one a couple of days ago. Um, where you, you are totally convinced that these squares are lined up in spirals. They're just squares. But when you look at it, you realize they're not spirals, they're circles. 
And no matter how hard you look at it, they don't look like circles. And I keep telling people, that's how easy it is to fool your eye. That's how easy it is to fool your brain. When you think you see a UFO and you, and you hear this guy saying, um, yeah, this UFO came by and it was a mile across and 20 miles away. And I think, how, how, do you, how do you know that? Did it fly between you and that distant tree? Was it between you and that mountain? Did you see it pass in front of a cloud that you know was a mile away? Or, you know, or was this thing an insect an inch across that was two feet away? And it turns, out, it turns out that happens a lot. And so you can't just trust your observations here. You really have to question everything, everything you're doing all along the line. Um, there we go. What is it to be a skeptic? Who, who are the skeptics out there? Well, you mentioned I'm the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation. James Randi is a noted conjurer and stage magician. Um, and he, if, you know, you've probably heard of Yuri Geller. One of the reasons Yuri Geller is not as famous as somebody like Michael Jackson, although they were friends, and Yuri Geller desperately tries to use Michael Jackson to make himself more famous. Uh, one of the reasons you don't hear about Yuri Geller all the time is because Randy was, was hounding him in the 1970s and debunking his spoon bending and making com compasses spin and all that. And uh, you, know, you can't prove that Yuri Geller's not psychic, but you can say that if he is, he's doing this the hard way because it, you can put a magnet in your finger and, and make a compass move and, and do all the tricks that, like that that are very easy. And that's what Randy did. He started the James Randi Educational Foundation to promote skepticism, to promote critical thinking, as we like to call it. Just, just thinking critically, just actually saying to yourself, you know, I think this, why? What is it I'm thinking and why? Um, he's also making his famous uh, skeptical face there. Um, I practiced and practiced. I'm not as skeptical as he is, no matter what I do. I just look like I, I actually have a little bit of gas there. Um, when I looked up skeptical faces online, I found this one, which killed me. Um, and, I, and I love this because babies are the least skeptical animals on the planet, right? They believe everything you tell them, which is why when I was a, a, a new parent, I said to, I, I told my wife, I, I don't ever want to lie to my, to my kid. I don't ever want to uh, uh, tell her to believe the things I believe in. I want her to find these out the, on herself. I want her to, I want to supply her with the tools that she needs to figure out what's going on around her, not to just tell her. Um, we had long arguments about Santa Claus, let me tell you that much. Um, and I lost, and I, I won't go, I won't tell you which, which way that went, but uh, I did lose. On, on my stance to my wife, who is evidently a much more powerful arguer than I am. Um, there are a lot of media for skepticism, and there's a lot of media out there for anti-skepticism, for, for people trying to convince you what's real and what isn't. And sometimes they're trying to fool you. And certainly the television, which I, I hear still, still goes on, that people still watch TV. I, it, it's amazing to me. Um, that is a big venue for this, but there are skeptical shows on television. This may, might surprise you. Can anybody name any? Do you think of any? Oh, curse you. Wasn't supposed to be first. You say, you'd say, uh, yeah, The Mentalist, right? And Bones and House, right? And all these shows. But in fact, the most skeptical show on TV is The Mythbusters. Thank you. Uh, yay. Um, these guys did not set out to make a show about science. They did not set out to make a show about skepticism. But that's exactly what they've done. I, I took this picture at Comic-Con uh, a few months ago. It was, uh, it was awesome to, to hang out with them a little bit. And um, they, that's what they do. They do, it's not really science. You know, it's not like you can publish their results necessarily in a journal. But they're using the scientific method. They're examining the evidence. They're, they're, they're going out there looking for something. They examine the, the, the hypothesis that that thing is presenting, that if you, you fall from a, 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 an airplane and you land on a building that's blowing up, the explosion will cushion your fall and you can land on your feet. Um, this was a very cool one. I just happened to see this one the other day. And it was a lot of fun to watch them do that. But that's a scientific stance. It's also a skeptical stance. Do we believe this? What's the evidence for this? Let's test it out. Um, Adam Savage is a huge skeptic. Um, and he, and I should say that Adam and Jamie are exactly like you see them on TV, which kills me. Um, Adam is, is hyperkinetic, and Jamie's always looking like, what, what am I doing? What, what am I doing here? That's Adam always, oh, what's going on? Um, Adam actually comes to our, our, we have a skeptical conference every year in Vegas in July, and Adam comes every year, and he has a great time every year. We love having him come because he is the face of sneaky skepticism. They never talk about scientific results on their show. They never talk about being skeptical, but that is exactly what they're doing, and I love them to pieces for it because they are teaching people how to think. 
I am not going to try to convince you that UFOs are not real up here today. I'm not going to talk about politics or religion or any of that kind of stuff because that's not the point here. The point is not to come to a conclusion. The point is how you reach that conclusion. That's the important thing. That's the important thing. Boy, this Mac is really uh, freaking out of me a little bit. There are people out there, though, who are trying to fool you. I'm going to talk about some of these things. Bart Sabrell is trying to convince you that the moon landings didn't happen. Yeah, Buzz Aldrin taught him a lesson a few years ago. You may, uh, you can look up Buzz Aldrin and Bart Sabrell if you're curious about what I'm talking about. If any of you have internet access here, I think uh, you might want to look that up. Uh, there are people who are trying to convince you that hyperdimensional aliens from the future are building mile-wide, really poorly sculpted faces on Mars, um, on Cydonia. Um, you may be inadequate in some way or another, and people are going to try to convince you of that if you recognize Smiling Bob from the, uh, is this Enzite? Is that what that was? Yeah, and these guys, were they, were they were fined for, I think, $500 million, some insane amount, and the people who are putting this are still are in jail now, uh, and yet they're still, it's still on TV. It's incredible. I'm, and um, another one is uh, Kevin Trudeau, who is the guy who's, who's trying to sell you coral calcium, cures they don't want you to know. This guy is telling you that if you have cancer, you can eat these pills and you'll be cured and, and, and mainstream, medicism, mainstream medicine doesn't want you to know this. And so what he's doing is, is he's basically, uh, he, he's a fraud. He's, he's been convicted on credit card fraud. And, um, you know, he's, he's killing people because there are people who are listening to him instead of going to their doctor and people are dying. Um, here's one of my favorite people, Jenny McCarthy. Um, I used to like her. I used to think she was funny. Now, um, I, if I even turn around and look at the screen, I'm going to get really angry. Um, she is the face of the anti-vaccination movement right now, trying to tie vaccines with autism, saying that if you, if you give your kids shots, they're going to be autistic. This is baloney. When you look at this stuff critically, you, you find that all the medical studies show there is no link between vaccines and autism. And uh, these people, they spin, fold, and mutilate reality. And it's really, really hard because they come out and they say things. And it sounds like what they're saying is right. There's fetal tissue in vaccines. There's tons of mercury in vaccines. There's all these poisons in vaccines. But they never put it in context. These people never say, oh, and by the way, the amount of mercury in these, in these, in these things is way below anything that can affect you. And it's out of your system in less than a day. So there's no way it can be, be doing this problem. They never talk about the studies that show that vaccines are not linked with autism or anything like that. You have to examine these things critically, including the stuff that we say, because scientists screw it up as well. You know, we may have a big press conference saying we found microbes in a Martian meteorite. Um, and really, if you watch that back, back in the, uh, what was it, 1996, when they said they found life in the Martian fossil, in fact, the scientists were really hedging and hawing and saying, well, you know, we found this, which is an indicator, and that, which is an indicator. And they showed the picture of those little wormy guys. Do you remember that? They showed that last and said, this is really our, our weakest evidence of this. But, of course, that's the one the press ran with. And, and so, uh, you know, over the course of years, it became clear that, that the evidence for this was really, really weak, and it, it wasn't working out as well as we had hoped. We're still looking for life on Mars, and there's still all kinds of stuff going on. And every time I hear about this, uh, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I try to be skeptical of it as well. And, and speaking of which, hey, it's August. How many of you have heard that Mars is going to be as big as the moon today? Right? A few of you are laughing, gotten this, this email. It just slays me every year. Started in 2003. Somebody sent out an email that said, Mars, through a telescope at 75 power, will look as big as the moon does to the naked eye. And it turns out that's true. If you magnify Mars's size by 75 times and you could compare it to the moon in the sky as observed with your eye, they'd be the same size. Awesome. But it got screwed around and people thought you could just look up and see Mars that big. And then every year, somebody has basically just changed the date on that thing to, the, to that year and said it again. I'm getting that email now. My mother-in-law forwarded it to me saying, you know, I heard about this, what's going on with it? And I said, no, it, not only is it not true, Mars is on the other side of the sun. It's as far away from the Earth as it can possibly be right now. So uh, it, it's just ridiculous. And these kind of things spread around and people, people retweet them, right? They, 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 they send this stuff around and it's a problem. Now, why is this important? You know, in most cases, it really isn't. Um, you know, Bart Sabrell, 100 years from now, nobody's going to know his name when they're out swimming on Armstrong Lake and walking down you know, Buzz Aldrin Avenue on the Lunar Colony. They're not even going to remember that people thought this stuff was fake, and that is fine with me. Um, and and that's, that's okay. But there are people out there who are trying to fool you, and they will take your money 
Uh, it, it's just no fun to be tricked. I mean, if it's, all in, if it's just a prank and it's all in good fun, it's not a big deal. But it, it just, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to be fooled. And there are people out there who will try to take your money, and there are people out there who will put you in medical risk. And that's, I've been focusing on that a lot lately because it's really been, been ticking me off, especially when we're talking about kids and people are trying to, trying to trick parents into, into believing what they're saying, or at least or it, it may not be on purpose. It may be that they honestly believe what they're saying, but what they're saying is wrong. And there's a medical outcome from this, and that really, that really bugs me. Um, and there's another thing, and, and maybe it's because I'm a scientist. I would rather see the universe for the way it really is and not have somebody uh, you know, put a filter in front of my eyes and say, here's how I want you to see the world. I want to see it for how it is. And I'm, I'm human, right? I can be tricked. I can be fooled. I, I want to believe things that I see when it's, when it's in, a, in 140 characters or less. Um, but it's not necessarily the way the universe really works. How can you be a skeptic? What does it mean to, to, to do this? How do you do this? Well, I'll ask you guys, have you ever, I know you're not supposed to do a reveal in PowerPoint, but there you go. As I, I put this together uh, a while ago, and uh, it's more fun to do it this way. Um, have you ever talked to people at a bar? Oh, wait, no, you're tech people. I'm sorry. Have you ever chatted online using uh, uh, yeah, IRC? Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever been sitting at a bar with your friends and somebody says, I heard that, ding, 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 little alarm should be going off. I heard that, you know. Uh, uh, there are death panels or whatever, you know. Um, and you should really, as soon as, as soon as you hear a phrase like that, you should really start being alarmed. Um, have you ever, you know, have you ever sent your mom to Snopes? Oh yeah, yeah, you know you have. Um, glass is a liquid! Yeah, let's go to Snopes and figure this out, okay? Uh, and, and the Mars is as big as the moon, I do that all the time, all the time. Um, yeah, you see something on TV, you've got an ad you see on somebody's website, and you send an angry email to the web, the web host saying, you know, that ad is, is, is contrary to the, to the idea behind the website. Um, that is, that, that's being skeptical. That's, that's actually being an active skeptic, which I'll get to in a moment. If you've ever yelled at your TV, um, if you've watched Mythbusters, you've yelled at your TV. Uh, Adam and Jamie like to talk about that a lot because uh, uh, they will sometimes have to gloss over stuff and you go, oh, you didn't you know, do this. I was, I was watching them the other day. They were testing to see if it if it's, takes less energy to turn on a light or to keep your lights on. You've probably heard this, right? If you keep your lights on for less than two minutes, it actually uses as much power as when you flip them on. So if you're only leaving a room for one minute, leave the light on. And they tested this and they did a really good job testing it and they forgot one thing. And I was talking to my daughter about it, and I was like, oh, they forgot this one thing. And, and then um, that, that right there, that's being skeptical. It's being skeptical of the skeptics. If you've ever tweeted about something that has made you unhappy, um, that, in fact, is, is, in a sense, being a skeptic because you're, you're, you're saying something that is, is going against the way you think, sh the way you think things should be. Um, if you've ever talked at a conference about skepticism or possibly talked about talking at a conference about skepticism, you may be a skeptic. I'm not going to turn this into a Jeff Foxworthy talk. Thank you. Don't worry about that. Um, there are two kinds of skepticism going on in the world right now, and, and, and it's, it's top-down versus bottom-up. Top-down are the, are the groups that are professional skeptics. I know that sounds kind of funny. You may have heard of some of these groups. The Center for Inquiry in New York, they have branches all over the country, and they're international as well, and they do a lot of stuff. They have a, a, a group of experts that, that, can, that can investigate ghosts. If you, have, if you think you have a ghost in your house, you know, they'll send somebody there they, so that you get hauntings, UFOs, uh, medical claims, all kinds of things. Um, the Skeptic Society, which is Michael Shermer's gig out in California, he does a lot of writing. He's Skeptical Inquirer or Skeptics Magazine. A lot of different, a lot of different outlets for him. The Australian Skeptics are good friends of mine. I love these guys because um, alternative, alternative medicine. Uh, you know, there's, you know what they call alternative medicine that works? Yeah, medicine, right? <laughs> so. It's some alternative medicine. Some alternative medicine works. You know, they, they, you talk about natural remedies. Uh, aspirin came from willow bark, and so yeah, some of the stuff literally grows on trees. Other stuff can kill you if you don't know what's going on. And Australia has a much harder time with that kind of stuff than we do here in the states. And there, the Australian skeptics are fighting this really hard, and I'm really proud of them. And then of course, there's the JRF, my own organization, James Rand Educational Foundation. We do a lot of stuff as well. But this is all sort of you know, we we're a nonprofit. We have our million dollar challenge. Have you heard of this? If, if you think you, if you have a paranormal claim, you can read minds, you can douse and, and find water underground, you can tell me 
uh, the next card I can flip over in my deck of Amazon cards, if you saw those outside. Um, if you can do that, and you can do it with statistical certainty, we'll give you a million bucks. Okay, we have a million bucks with Goldman Sachs. It is sitting there, I promise. People always say, yeah, we, you know, we don't have it, but, oh, is that bad, Goldman Sachs? I don't know. Um, I'm with tech people here. Probably somebody is transferring that to their, their bank account right now. You're hacking into there. Um, forget it's a tech conference here. Just, oh, yeah. Um, and so that's, that's one of our ways of, of showing that um, not that paranormal claims are wrong, that there's no such thing as psychics, there's no such thing as ghosts. Um, we're just trying to show that a lot of these claims, you need to look at them skeptically. When somebody claims they're a ghost, you know, they, they have a ghost in, the, in their house, and you watch these, these awful, awful shows on TV with these ghost hunter people, um, and you know, every single thing they see, it's a ghost. It's like, yeah, that, that was the cat. You know, it's not a, not a ghost. Um, you need to be skeptical about these things. And so we're, we're these professional organizations. We're going out there and doing it. But what we're seeing now a lot more is grassroots skepticism. And I am so fired up about this. Uh, Robert Lancaster's a guy. He started, he came to our, we have these annual meetings called the Amazing Meetings because it's, uh, Randy's uh, stage name was James the Amazing Randy. And now we call them the Amazing Meetings in Vegas. He was coming to these meetings, Robert Lancaster, and he decided that he could do this as well. He, there was a woman in Australia who was claiming that she was, um, she was in the World Trade Center right before it came down, and she was going out and giving talks about this, and, and it turns out she was never there. She was totally lying about this, and he put up a website called Stop Kaz. Kaz was her name, and was able to actually uh, uh, keep her from, from scamming people, essentially. He took on Sylvia Brown, who was a psychic, psychic, air quotes, um, can speak to the dead, and uh, she charges a huge amount of money uh, to, to, to have people come in and say, you know, um, I'm sensing an M. Does anybody here have a, a recently passed over relative whose name starts with M? You know, no, because that's such an uncommon name, right? Or J, I love that, because there's no John and James and Jacob and all that sort of thing. And so he, he wound up putting up these websites, and he's gotten a lot of progress with this. Sylvia Brown knows who he is because he's been out there. He's not saying she's a liar. He's not saying she's scamming people. He's not even saying she's wrong. He's just putting up the evidence for what she's saying, and it's fantastic. Skeptic is a group of women, young women, who uh, are, are examining evidence. They've got a website and a blog, skeptic.org. Um, one of the things that's really cool is that when you think of skeptics, you might think of, of you know, balding middle-aged white guys in their lab coats sitting around going, arr, 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 right, not, not being happy about stuff. We are seeing younger and younger people showing up to our meetings every year. We had 30, 30 40%, 30% of our crowd were women this year, which was fantastic. Um, a lot of skeptic groups you go to, it, it's much, much lower than that. What's the harm.net? That's a great one because you say, hey, what's the harm in believing in this? And then you go there and it's like, oh yeah, 1,500 people died last year from believing in that. That's the harm. And there's a lot of other things here. Skepticamp is great because that is literally audience participation. If you, you mentioned bar camps earlier this morning, Skepticamp are people who show up at a meeting like this and they present their own stuff. So everybody in the audience gets their chance to stand up and present this kind of stuff. It's exactly the sort of thing I want the JREP to support. I want to be able to have, to get donations to us so that we can spread that joy out to other people and help them, help them do what they need to do to spread the word. There's also podcasts. I'm, I just have a list up there of a bunch of different podcasts. Um, they do a tremendous job getting, getting the word out to people. Sometimes they get a little heavy-handed, you know, they can be a little cynical. Other times they're just presenting evidence, and it's a fantastic way to do this because, um, because I hear podcasts are very popular. Um, you know, I'm going to skip over a couple of things here because I don't need to go into them. Um, bulletin boards, does anybody here participate in bulletin boards? I'm curious. Just a couple of people. I've been thinking that. I think that bulletin boards are kind of sort of on their way out for people who are really, really technically savvy. I think the communities are more like Twitter and on the blogs and commenting there, that sort of thing. Who knows what's going to be next? But we do, have, we do have a forum on the Randy site. There are other fora as well. The Bad Astronomy Universe today is another skeptical site. And the good thing about these is that they keep a record of what people say. This is a great place to gather information. P the people become friends online. You know, you know all this, right? And uh, it, it does a good job of, of maintaining a database of information. And we like that because the more people interconnect with their skepticism, the better it gets. It can be a little bit of an echo chamber, um, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's something we like to support. 
there are people out there, there are doomsayers out there, oh my gosh, with the 2012 crowd saying that the Mayan calendar is going to end in December 2012, and they say, solar flares, galactic alignment, and I'm just, <sighs> that's, the, that's the actual skeptic mating call. <sighs> um, <laughs> I do... Uh, I, I do a lot of radio interviews, and, and boy, they email me, and that is the first thing I think is like, really, I have to talk about the Apollo hoax again, or do I really have to waste my freaking life talking about 2012, which is based on nonsense, and then they go fishing around for more nonsense, and then they just throw nonsense at you, hoping that you'll be over nonsense and go, I'm so baffled by all this, it must be true, because that's the way most of this stuff works. Um, it's really tough to fight this kind of stuff. And in fact, the, the real problem is, is that the people who are purveying this, the people who are writing the books, the people who have websites, they have a vested interest in it. And so you can talk to them all you want, but you're going to get this reaction from them. You're never going to convince them. You want to convince the fence sitters, right? When I go on the radio and debate these guys, I'm not trying to convince Bart Sabrell the moon landings are real because he's never ever going to pay attention to the evidence. I love it when people email me and say, well, you know, what about this lunar reconnaissance orbiter? This is a new probe that NASA has orbiting the moon. It just returned pictures of the, the Apollo sites. And in, for the Apollo 14 site, you can see the footprints of the astronauts on the moon, the boot prints, I suppose. Um, and people were saying, is this going to finally shut up the moon hoaxers? And I laughed. And I said, they don't live in an evidence-based world to begin with. You can bring them all the evidence you want. They're never going to believe it. So I'm not trying to convince those folks. I'm trying to convince the people who are listening to this, but maybe don't understand what's going on. Now, I learned a couple of years ago that at, no matter where you give a talk, um, you don't make assumptions about the audience. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what a social network is? Right. Well, the important thing, okay, yeah, Scoble doesn't. Um, that's, uh, yeah. Um, how many followers do you, do you have? Yeah, yeah. I think we have to use scientific notation for that. Um, I gave this talk recently to some people who weren't really familiar with online stuff, but I, I, all I want to say is the key to a social network is interactivity. Without that, of course, it's nothing, and that's the, that's the important spot. Um, and with, with Twitter, and, and, and part, I know this is, this, this is all way behind you guys, um, but I, I, I'm lazy and I use my old slides. Um, the thing about Twitter is that it's easy. I, I, I made a joke on Twitter a couple of months ago where I said, the problem with Twitter is it's too easy to complain. And, and nobody really got it because I was complaining about, complaining on, yeah, see, see, you guys aren't getting it either. You guys need more coffee, I guess. Um, I, or maybe, you know, I would never accept the fact that may, maybe it's just not funny. Um, <laughs> But Twitter, it is so easy to retweet stuff now. It is so easy to just say, oh, you know, I'm going to retweet this. And the problem becomes if you, if you become somebody who is well known on Twitter, people will tend to retweet you. And I've said stuff on Twitter that was wrong. I've, and then I've gotten retweeted, and it was a problem. Um, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to just flash through some of this stuff. Um, oh, I do, I do need to say this. Grant Imahara had, had done a robot pickup lines thing. And so I went out there and said, uh, you know, for a robot pickup line, right? <laughs> Your lips say zero, but your eyes say one. And it was, you know, I beat, I was ahead of Ashton Kutcher for like an hour on, on Twitter. Um, so I'm just trying to break that paradigm that skeptics are curmudgeons and jerks and don't have a sense of humor. Um, I was really damn proud of that. Um, yeah, you guys know about Dig and Reddit. I, I, the, I like to get on there. It's, it's nice to, to, to see that because you can get 150, 200,000 people seeing your, your page, which is a, a good group, a good, good number of people. It, but it, it, Dig and Reddit are very different. Dig is sort of top down. It's sort of, you know, this is, this is how we want things to be, whereas Reddit is more bottom up. Um, and, I, and Reddit now actually has a skepticism uh, uh, section on it. And I checked it the other day and it had, it had one article in it. Um, <laughs> Whereas uh, the pictures of, of you know, women in bikinis under the pics section of Reddit had gazillions of things. So you know, knowing your audience evidently is important. But uh, it, it's good that, to see that that's out there. Dig doesn't have anything quite like that. So it's a little bit tougher to get into the skeptical aspects of that. But it is good to see that social networks are picking this kind of stuff up. Um, I want to just give you a brief anecdote here. Because you know, anecdotes are data. Um, that's a joke, too. Which said that's another, okay, that's another skeptical thing. I don't care how many ghosts you've seen, okay? It's not data. Uh, and when you tell me a story about it, I want to see the actual evidence. Um, it's a tale of two satellites, an Iridium-33 and a so uh, Soviet. See here, I say it's a, I'm, you can tell how old I am. Um, a Cosmos 2251 satellite. These are both uh, uh, satellites that were in polar orbits. In February of this year, um, their orbits uh, intersected. 
in fact. And this was, uh, this was seen at 1656 uh, Greenwich Mean Time. These two satellites collided over, roughly over the North Pole. Um, and I've got an animation of this. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is a very cool animation that shows what happened. Um, they collided at several miles per second, and they basically exploded. I mean, when, you, when, you're, when two things hit at that sort of speed, uh, it's, basically, it's basically, you might as well just, just give, you put a ton of dynamite on these things, just tore them into shrapnel. And they had these expanding debris clouds which were moving around the Earth. This was huge news when it happened. It was all over Twitter for well over an hour. So um, <laughs> that was a big deal. And you can see the debris spreading there. And there was another, um, another diagram here that shows how that debris was being tracked by NORAD and other groups. And it was spreading out. It was, it's, this is a pretty serious problem because now, you know, any other satellite that slams into one of these pieces of debris, I mean, a, a fleck of paint hitting you at eight miles per second is going to destroy your satellite. Um, well, not too much later, in Texas, do you remember, do you guys, did anybody hear about this? There's a very bright bolide in Texas, and you can see it. There it is, right? Let me use my goofy little NASA laser pointer that evidently doesn't work. It's contractors. Um, you can see it. I was, I, I, I was a contractor with NASA for several years, actually. So you can see it. it this is the only known video footage of it. It was, it was during a marathon, and this guy shot it. It's great because you can actually, he, we knew what direction he was facing. You can figure out how fast that thing was. Within minutes of this thing happening, it was everywhere. And the first thing I thought, everybody was saying, oh, you know, a week ago those satellites collided. That must have been a piece of debris. And I knew right away it wasn't because that debris was way up in orbit. It was hundreds of miles above the surface of the Earth. There was no way that stuff was already starting to burn up. It was going to take months and months for that stuff to come down. I knew it couldn't be it. Plus, it was moving in the wrong direction for the debris, and it was moving way, way, way too, uh, too quickly. Um, when, when, a, when a chunk of asteroid comes in, like, like I was talking about with Chris on Call for Help, it comes in really quickly. It's coming in at, 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 at 10 or 20 miles per second, whereas satellite debris would be coming in at like 5. So you can really tell the difference between the two. But it doesn't matter because I know that. I'm an astronomer. I can figure that stuff out. I have experience and I, I've learned that stuff. But for anybody who's just thinking about it, if two things happen at roughly the same time, they must be related. That's a logical fallacy. And so when this stuff got posted, it was everywhere. It was on the online news, TV news, Twitter. Oh my gosh. What happened was there was a news feed on Twitter that has like 40,000 followers or something like that, and it got retweeted by everybody. And so this was a hugely trending topic. And eventually, I believe Alpha Centaurians were, were, were writing about this, saying those stupid Earthlings in there, they're colliding satellites. Um, this was a firestorm, pardon the expression. It was incredibly, incredibly difficult to, to get the word out that that's not what was going on. Now, for me, you know, it's important for me because, ah, sorry about that. Um, I'm an astronomer. I want people to understand the science of what's going on. So I was really trying to fix this and, and, and get the word out that, it was, that, that this is not what was going on. It wasn't, you know, in the, in the scheme of things, the fact that most of you didn't even hear about this shows that this isn't a critical thing. But this stuff happens because um, I'll say that um, Jenny McCarthy is on Twitter talking about stuff. There are other people out there. They're going to be promoting their stuff and reality-based people are going to be promoting theirs. So how do we fight this kind of thing? And really the answer is I'm not sure. I don't know. And that's part of being a skeptic is, is admitting when you don't know something. And I, it's, it's hard sometimes. But in fact, I do have some ideas. And one thing is to simply is to fight it is to don't sit back and just let this stuff happen. Is to actually get online and do something about it. If you've got a blog or, or, you, can, or you know somebody who may know something about it, talk to them. Um, participate. Join up with these groups. If they sound like uh, they're doing something that you're interested in, like the skeptics, or uh, if, if you're Aus Australian and you want to you talk to them about that sort of thing, with the local, the local top-down or the bottom-up groups, whatever, join up. See what they're doing. Because with, with, the, with the JREF, the, with Randy, Randy is a stage magician. He was many years ago. And so we do a lot of magical stuff. There's a lot of magic ties in with skepticism a lot because of people trying to fool you. But now I'm a, I'm a scientist, and so now we're doing a lot of science stuff. We have doctors who are affiliated with us, so we're doing medical stuff. There's a lot of different stuff going on there. There's always something going on that will be of interest to you because, you know, it's not, not like there's anybody trying to fool you in the tech community, right? Um, join up and just basically start something. The uh, people who are here are, are going to, I think, be skewed towards movers and shakers. Um, a lot of you are not grassroots by definition. Anything, anything I do in skepticism, it's, it's kind of the, the, uh, 
the, the curse of being with a professional organization. I can't do anything grassroots anymore. I can't do anything on my own. I, it has to be as, as, as part of a professional organization. It's, it's a little bit ironic sometimes. But anybody can do this. It's easy. You can start it up. It's just, it can be a hobby, and it can turn into something big. I did start off on my own with my Bad Astronomy website, just screwing around, talking about how much I hated the movie Armageddon that had no science in it. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm, I'm being invited to Gnome Dex. The lesson here is to always be on alert. This is a picture of actually my dog uh, who sits in the backyard and, and can sense squirrels for 100 miles. Um, um, for both democracies and squirrels, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. I, I, I put this up, but it's also true. I posted this on July 4th, actually. But it's also true just in reality. You cannot sit back. You cannot rest. The forces of unreason are always out there all the time. They're in tech. They're in medicine. They're in science. They're on TV. They're on the web. They're selling books. They're on the street corners. And the only way to fight them is to continue the fight and always fight them. And that's what I'm going to do, and I'm hoping that if any of you are interested, come and find me, and we can talk about how we can do this together. Thank you. Time for questions? Am I, I got the five-minute warning about three minutes ago, so. Do we have any questions? Yes. So from a from a business standpoint, when when we're, you know, evaluating possible ideas for crazy things we could do and someone always says, well, you know, and they come up with six reasons why it won't work. And sometimes you just have to think outside the box or throw some spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks. How do you balance the desire to go and do something crazy and just see with the need to really evaluate things critically? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, for every scientist you hear about, there's you know, a bunch more that went off the rails and, uh, and, and, and went off and examined something that turned out not to, ha not, not to work. And you, the only thing to do is to try it, right? If something really is weird and the universe can fool you, if you've ever studied quantum mechanics, you know, man, oh man, is that, it's baffling. And in 1900, you know, some people got together and said, you know, maybe it's this. Maybe things really aren't going the way we thought. And we really need to try this. And it was a crazy thought, but what started happening was it, it, it worked. And, and that's how you know when you're on the right track, when it starts making predictions. Dark energy is the same thing. This is in, in my own field of astronomy. Um, totally, totally screwed up idea that the universe is not, is, it's expanding, we know that. But not only is it expanding, but it appears to be expanding ever faster every day, which is totally contrary to everything we've been thinking for 50 years. But the evidence is holding up. And I didn't believe it at first, but then they kept, you know, they had a, they had a list. How can we be wrong? I, I, they literally had this list. They're scratching it off. You know, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. And finally, they scratched everything off their list. That doesn't mean there's nothing they don't know about. Uh, they could still be wrong. But now it's looking pretty good that dark energy is real. We know quantum mechanics exists because we build nuclear weapons, because you're all sitting in front of computers that use quantum mechanics. Um, that was the biggest revolution in science for hundreds of years. So the question is, how do you know when to go off on the rails? You know, you can dabble in it a little bit and say, maybe, maybe I need to try, try, maybe this is a little wacky, let's look at it. And if it doesn't work, you know, you can abandon it. It's a, it's a judgment call. And uh, if you talk to the most successful scientists in the world, they will, they will tend to say, oh, yeah, I tried something and it didn't work and I tried that and it didn't work and then I, kept, I just kept trying. And eventually the, the wacky idea down at the bottom of the list is the one, the one that wound up describing the world the best. Um, the problem is, is that when you scratch that one off and then you keep looking for more, and that happens too, and that happens even with the best of scientists. There's, there's a point where you turn around and say, oh, I'm totally lost. And it, that's a hard thing to know. Um, and basically when everybody else is telling you, yeah, you're wrong, at some point you have to say, maybe I am. One more? Well, right next door, that makes it easy. Oh, oh okay, fine. <laughs> Oh, he's got a mic. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that was awesome. Really loved the presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess I, I, I try and think about this a lot, and the question I always come to is, how do you make skepticism and truth viral and like overpowering enough to like drown out the bullshit? Like, are there ways that you think about making either reputation more visible or even like I think about how do you how do you try and create you know viral memes around skepticism so that you can basically defend people from bullshit? Oh, if I knew that. 
um, I get paid by advertisements on my website. If I could go viral with every blog post, I would, I would buy and sell all of you. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, one, thing, one thing that I'm trying to do is make it fun. And that's, that's something that the, 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 our foundation has sort of done by accident. We started having these meetings, and we saw that the crowd was getting younger every, every year. And so this year, I dabbled in having science and entertainment, uh, skepticism and entertainment on stage. So we had um, Bill Prady, who's the executive producer of The Big Bang Theory, for example, which has a lot of, oh, just one, yeah, there we go, okay, good. A smattering of applause, excellent. Um, but he talked about science and skepticism in his show. And it's a, it's a very popular show, so I thought that was, that was going to be cool. Anybody going to Dragon Con this year? Really? Okay. Well, then never mind. I'll drop that entire line of thought. Um, but in fact, we're going, you know, we're at, we're at Comic Con and we're going to Dragon Con. And um, I've got a, a panel called Sneaky Skepticism with Adam Savage from the Mythbusters, Scott Sigler, who is a New York Times best selling author. Oh, you guys know Sigler? Okay. Um, his stuff is really good. He's science based horror. It's not supernatural, it's all science based. It's really good stuff. And so I'm trying to, trying to show that you can be sneaky and skeptical. You, there was a word you used, I can't remember what it was exactly, uh, but Penn and Teller have a show on Showtime, uh, right? And, and they can, you know, they can push it pretty hard and they're not, they're not, they're sometimes skeptical, cynical and not skeptical, but that's a good show because it shows you how they do their skepticism. That's how it goes viral, is you make it fun. And when stuff is fun, then, then people want to do it. And I'm hoping that, that instead of being, you know, the, the cabal of, of, of grizzled old bastards in the, in, the, in the room, you know, deciding what is and isn't real, it actually becomes more of a participatory sto uh, sport. And that's, I think that's how we can make it fun. Because everybody needs to be skeptical. When you go to the car dealership, you're a skeptic, right? But you have to understand that that, that can apply to everything. And I'll, and I'll, I'll end it with this. Why, my, my daughter was about five years old, we're watching a kid's show, uh, and then they cut to a commercial, and they show these kids, and you know, I'm always telling her, you know, do you think that shampoo really made that woman's hair look like that? That sort of thing. And then she's watching this commercial, these kids playing with this toy, and she's, she turns to me afterwards and says, you know, I don't think that toy is that much fun. I think that the people who were filming that told them to play with it and make it look like a lot of fun. And I went, <gasps> <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you.